Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern. Before I turn to today's poem, I just want to let you know, we will be announcing the winners of our competition here soon. So make sure that you have checked your Facebook messages and your emails because you may have received a message from me. I'm actually waiting on one more winner to uh, get back to me before we can uh, before we can make the announcements. And I want to say there were so many great great entries and choosing the winners was very difficult for us. And I know when you choose winners, there has to be losers uh, or people who are at least not winners, you know, but I want everybody to know who has submitted that your kids or, or you, if you're listening, uh, did an incredible job and I hope you'll keep doing it. Um, we are going to try to find some ways to, uh, to reward as many kids as we can for putting in all the hard work. So there's a few things I've, I'm working on right now, but I just want to say thank you to everyone who submitted. Today's poem is by Anne Bradstreet. She was a Puritan poet who lived from 1612 to 1672. She was one of the most prominent poets of early America. She was the first writer in uh, the North American colonies to be published. Uh, she was published back in England even. And she is considered uh, the first major Puritan figure in American literature. The poem I'm going to read today, I'll have more to say about it, of course, here in a few minutes, but it is called The Author to Her Book. And this is actually one of the poems that I remember most from my time in college studying poetry. I'm not exactly sure why, because I didn't particularly love it at the time, but it it's one that I remember for some reason. Uh, maybe I'll be able to figure that out while we're recording here. But here is Anne Bradstreet's The Author to Her Book. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth didst by my side remain, till snatched from thence by friends, less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view, made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge where errors were not lessened. All may judge. At thy returning, my blushing was not small, my rambling brat, in print, should mother call. I cast thee by as one unfit for light, thy visage was so irksome in my sight. Yet being mine own, at length affection would thy blemishes amend, if so I could. I washed thy face, but more defects I saw, and rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. I stretched thy joints to make thee even feet, yet still thou runst more hobbling than is meet. In better dress to trim thee was my mind, but not save homespun cloth in the house I find. In this array amongst vulgars mayst thou roam. In critics' hands beware thou dost not come, and take thy way where yet thou art not known, if for thy father asked, say thou hadst none. And for thy mother, she, alas, is poor, which caused her thus to send thee out of door. So this poem is written in what is called heroic couplet. And heroic couplet is, it's a pair of rhyming lines. The meter is usually iambic, iambic pentameter, but may also be tetrameter. The rhyme scheme progresses as A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, and so on. And the heroic couplet was typically related to forms in which high subject matters could be written. It was often used for translation of epic poetry from the classical Latin and Greek. And it works by adapting, it comes from the old Chaucerian line from Geoffrey Chaucer from the Canterbury Tales, and is often has a pause or what's called a sejura right in the middle of a line. And that's one of the dramatic uh, elements to it, the formal elements that creates drama to the poem. I won't get into that last bit very much, but this Chaucer part is really interesting. Anne Bradstreet, uh, unlike many women of her era, was highly educated. And so she would have uh, been very familiar with Chaucer. And in this poem, I see both the tendency towards being a little bit overwrought that you'll find in Chaucer, but also his sense of humor. So in some ways, the poet who is writing this, you know, Anne Bradstreet seems to be writing almost as if she's writing from the perspective of a Chaucerian character. And yet at the same time, there is that sort of tongue-in-cheek sense of humor about, about the work uh, that also is very Chaucerian. For example, even in that line, I stretch thy joints to make the even feet. Feet being the, the metrical term for 
Um, a foot usually contains one stressed syllable and then one unstressed symbol. So in an, an iambic pentameter, the meter contains however many feet. So even there, you've got this, there's this wittiness to what she's doing there. The image there is a little bit on the nose, so to speak, uh, which makes it somewhat humorous. <laughs> and yet it also works, right? As someone who is a poet, um, working through the, the life of her book, processing the life of her book. And of course, every writer, every artist really, knows the feeling of releasing something you've created into the wild, so to speak. Here, for Anne Bradstreet, that work is her child. She dresses it. She has to let go of it, much like a parent does. She calls it the ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain uh, that by her side after its birth remained till someone else forced her to take it away. So this is one of those great poems about the artistic process, something people have been writing about ever since and even before. Uh, <laughs> Shakespeare wrote about it. In many ways, this is a precursor, though, I think, to so many great American poets, you know, such as Emily Dickinson uh, and Robert Frost, and even the likes of Wendell Berry and William Carlos Williams, who spent so much time thinking and writing about the nature of creativity, um, the tensions and anxieties that go with that. So I think that uh, the, the context of this poem is very interesting because it's moving us forward into the contemporary age um, in terms of the things that she's thinking about. But also it's rooted so deeply in the medieval and renaissance era when the heroic couplet was being formed and then being transformed uh, over and over again and, and really taking root. Um, and then in the 1700s, after Anne Bradstreet, it became one of the dominant poetic forms and she was a key figure in that. So we have this, <laughs> this American poet published in England a Puritan figure, a woman who lays the, helps lay the groundwork for one of the most important forms of the, of the 18th century. And, but then she's also laying the groundwork for the American canon, for the American poets to, to follow in her footsteps. So here, one more time, Anne Bradstreet's the author to her book. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth didst by my side remain, till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view, made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. At thy return my blushing was not small, my rambling brat in print should mother call. I cast thee by as one unfit for light, Thy visage was so irksome in my sight. Yet, being mine own, at length affection would thy blemishes amend, if so I could. I washed thy face, but more defects I saw, and rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. I stretched thy joints to make thee even feet, yet still thou runst more hobbling than is meet. In better dress to trim thee was my mind but not save homespun cloth i' the house I find. In this array amongst vulgars mayst thou roam, in critics' hands beware thou dost not come, and take thy way where yet thou art not known. If for thy father asked, say thou hadst none. And for thy mother, she alas is poor, which caused her thus to send thee out of door. This has been The Daily Poem. Thanks for listening. I'll be back tomorrow with another one.